part of the first faculty of medicine uh, at the Charles University in Prague. My name is Karel Czerny and I'm head of the Institute. As some of you may know, from time to time, we organize uh, lectures where our guests discuss topics always somehow linked with the underlying uh, theme of history of medicine. And this time is uh, no exception. We will be hearing about ancient Asclepieia, and I'm sure that we are going to enjoy this lecture thoroughly. Um, we had to move our activities into the virtual space, uh, which leads me to, um, to a technical request. Please, um, everyone in the audience, I would like to ask you to keep your microphones muted throughout the lecture. Um, and of course, you can turn micro microphones on uh, during the, the, the discussion as you engage in the discussion. Um, I don't want to take um, much more of your time, so let me, let me finish my introduction with, uh, 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 with saying thank you to everyone who is in, in the audience. Um, we are happy to have you. I also wanted to express my gratitude to our speaker, who is going to be introduced shortly. And last but not least, I wanted to say thank you to my colleague, Professor Tomáš Alušík, who kindly organized this, uh, organized this uh, event for, for the Institute. And now let me hand over the spotlight to Tomáš so that Tomáš can uh, uh, introduce uh, the, our guest and later take over the discussion after the lecture ends. Tomáš, if you would be so kind, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tomáš Alušík and I am the Institute's uh, coordinator of this uh, lecture series. I would like to introduce uh, our uh, tonight's speaker, Dr. Milena Melko. Milena uh, is uh, a classical archaeologist and a member of the Faculty of Classics and uh, the new college uh, of the University of Oxford. She received her education in classics at the University of Pisa and in classical archaeology at the University of Messina. Prior to coming to Oxford, she was a fellow of the Italian and British schools of archaeology in, in Athens, of the American Academy in Rome, and of the Center for Hellenic Studies at Harvard University. She has worked on surveys and excavations in Greece, Sicily, and Albania. Since 2004, she has been curating the collection of casts of Greek and Roman sculptures at the Ashmolean Museum, while teaching classical archaeology for the Faculty of Classics. Since 2008, she is a lecturer in classical art and archaeology at New College. Her current uh, research is mainly directed at the interpretation of the archaeology and history of Greek sanctuaries and cults in late Hellenistic and early Roman times. In her recent publications, she has mostly attempted a redefinition of the role, functioning, and fragmentation of Greek religious sites, especially in their later periods of activity. Since 2008, uh, she has been directing a team from the University of Oxford in the joint Italian-Albanian-UK uh, excavations at Nadeanopolis in Albania. And in 2016, she started a new field project in Hadrian's villa in Tivoli, uh, close to Rome. Uh, her tonight's uh, topic is uh, Asclepios and Asclepia, reconstructing the history of a Greek healing cult. Milena, thank you for participating, uh, and uh, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much, Thomas, and thank you uh, for, for the kind invitation from the your Institute and uh, from you, of course. And uh, thank you also for bringing me back to Asclepius because it's something, it's a subject that I, I try to avoid uh, for, for a few years after the completion of my doctorate and my book, actually. <laughs> but it was interesting to get back to it. And uh, um, I have two warnings. The first is that uh, I, I'm not very well gifted in the use of Zoom because we always use Teams, so I might uh, have some problems in the sharing and so forth, but bear with me, we'll get there. And uh, the second one is that uh, this is, uh, I mean, I've 
a sort of generic lecture to introduce you to a subject which is much larger than uh, than I could cover myself. So it's um, uh, bear in mind that uh, um, I'm trying to 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 give a little. Uh, sort of show you the highlights of the subject rather than a thorough um, discussion of it. So I'll try to share my screen now, finger crossed. Um, share. Is it working? Yes, it is working. Everybody happy? Okay, good. So Asclepius and Asclepiaia. Uh, the centuries and the cult of Asclepius, the god of healing and the patron of ancient medicine, accompanied the historical and cultural development of the Greek world from the late classical to the late imperial period. The history has a clear beginning, the 5th century BC, when Asclepius as a new god was introduced into the traditional Greek pantheon, and uh, his myth of birth, life, and the Olympic afterlife remains unclear somewhat controversial and was often used and appropriated for propaganda purposes by different political entities. In the Homeric tradition, Asclepius was, sorry, it's not moving. Okay, try again, it's not moving. Oh, here it is. So in the Homeric tra tradition, Asclepius was a Thessalian hero fighting in the Trojan Wars together with the sons of Podalirius and Machaon, the kings of Tricca, the Salian Tricca, and uh, Machaon himself was uh, known as a physician, so uh, as a doctor uh, in, uh, in, in uh, the Trojan uh, Wars. For Pinder, for Hesiod and the Homeric hymns, Asclepius was the divine son of Apollo and of a mortal woman, Coronis, similarly born in Thessaly. And, uh, um, uh, Coronis was uh, later um, uh, killed by Apollo because of her infidelity, and uh, Asclepius was, uh, uh, according to the myth, was pulled out of a womb um, by, by Apollo in this sort of first, probably, Caesarean birth uh, of, uh, of antiquity. Um, and for the Epidorians, Asclepius was born in Epidorus to Apollo and an Epidorian girl this time, uh, an Epidorian Coronis, while for the Messenians he was the son of uh, the Messenian Arsinoe, daughter of Leucippus, and therefore connected to the mythical genealogy of the kings of Messenia. Finally, for Pausanias, who mediates between uh, the most successful Thessalian and the Pidorian tradition, Coronis was of Thessalian origin, accompanied the father, Phlegias, into the Peloponnese for an expedition, where Inepidorus had a liaison with Apollo and gave birth to Asclepius, who was exposed as a baby on a mountain near the sanctuary. So you can see that the tradition shows a very clear uncertainty, which is uh, in the definition of Asclepius as a man, as a god, as a hero. And uh, I believe that only the archaeological records from his sanctuary, so from the Asclepieia, might uh, um, give, uh, provide some light on the matter. And uh, at least they confirm uh, the clear origin of the cult uh, that uh, starts from the 5th century BC, when Asclepius was worshipped in Greece as a god, like all the others. So as a god, not rather like as an hero, as a hero or a mortal. By the beginning of the 5th century BC, the iconography, the attributes, the sanctuaries and the rituals for Asclepius appear to be fixed and easily recognizable all over Greece. Asclepius is represented mostly as a bearded, middle-aged, sort of fatherly figure, dressed in a hemation, which leaves his torso partially bare, and often accompanied by a snake. Most of his representations, especially in the 4th century BC, seems to be directly inspired by his cult statues. This is one of the most famous, the Asclepius, uh, uh, the, the type Justini, probably the Asclepius of the Asclepiaeon in Athens. 
uh, where, um, as in many other statues, he is dressed in the same way with a himatium that leaves his breast, uh, his, uh, his uh, body half naked and uh, leaning on a staff on which uh, a, a snake uh, climbs. In many of the votive reliefs, Asclepius is accompanied by a sort of undistinguishable family. Uh, where wife and daughters have different names according to the accompanying descriptions that allow us to recognize them, but they are not distinguishable as iconographical types. So they are just draped female figures, not particularly characterized for age or by age or attributes. And the sons, including Macaon and Podalirius, originally the heroes of the Trojan Wars, are uh, simply young nude heroes, uh, often sharing the attributes of um, uh, sort of classical hunters, such as uh, spears, swords, and uh, sometimes they are in the company of dogs. So you can see some examples here of representation of Aegeus, of, of, of the daughters of Asclepius from the baths on Dion in Dion and uh, of uh, um, Pudalirius uh, as a nude young hero uh, from, uh, as well from the baths in uh, Dion in Greece. The only exception seems to be uh, Hygieia, uh, the favorite and the most frequently represented daughter of Asclepius, who is often recognizable by uh, the iconography known from an Athenian cult statue while she feeds a snake from a pater, from a cup. So the visual and the written document seems to confirm that Asclepius, Hygieia, and the family actually healed the sick in centuries fittingly constructed in order to fulfill the needs of a precise ritual. These sanctuaries were preferably built in extra urban locations, previously sacred to other deities with healing powers. For example, Asclepius succeeded to his father Apollo in many locations either on top of mountains, along main roads, or on the seashore. All sanctuaries incorporated sources of fresh water and large reception areas. The presence of a temple and a statue of the god was important, but it was not essential. Whereas the central and most important building was actually the, the um, incubation hall, the enchoimeterium, the place to sleep. Here, Asclepius healed the sick through the ritual of incubation. During this ritual, the sick were allowed to spend the night in a special and inaccessible abaton, as defined in Greek by the sources, uh, part of the sanctuary, where they enjoyed a miraculous sleep during which Asclepius and all his family appeared uh, in a dream and heal them. So here you have an example of a healing tale from the Epidorian Asclepiaion, one of the many listed in the healing inscriptions of, uh, of uh, uh, placed probably uh, in the incubation hall, which contributed to the preparation, sort of the psychological preparation of the worshippers before entering uh, this building. Uh, this is quite a, a serious injury. Uh, a whippus who had a spear in his jaw uh, is left in the temple, the god extracted it, and the whip was departed cure, holding the spearhead in his hand. But we have also much lighter forms of much lighter miracles, uh, like the one of Heraeus of Mytilene, who ba Mytilene ba basically goes to Asclepius because he's bald, he has no hair on his head, but an abundant growth on his chin. Uh, and since he was ashamed, he's left in the abaton, uh, in the temple, and the god, in this case, anoints his head with some drugs. So we have sort of, uh, some uh, sort of uh, indication of a procedure uh, being performed and made his hair grow. So uh, from small to big, all miracles were possible in this, uh, um, uh, in this special hall uh, where people slept, uh, waiting for the healing dream. So um, this was basically, as you can see from the text, a moment of direct communication between the god and the individuals and sort of attested the presence of the god in the sanctuary and made the sanctuaries of Asclepius worth traveling to, worth uh, um, being in, because that was the only place where people could actually get in contact with the divinity. 
um, and address the divinity directly on a personal, on a sort of individual level. In most of the known Asclepieia, uh, the incubatorian, the, the incubation hall took the form of a stoa, um, so a portico, uh, often lined with beds. You can see in this reconstruction of the, uh, in, of the incubation hall, hall of Epidaurus, which actually has two sections. The second section that you see also in the photo is the, the extension of the first one, because uh, probably there was the need of extending it because of the number of, of customers in the sanctuary. So it was normally lined with beds, but it was inaccessible. So the, in, the access was obviously very strictly regulated. And as you can see in the upper part of the stoa, which is this one, uh, you have, we have uh, um, balustrades co covering uh, the columns, linking the columns. Uh, not in the other part, but uh, we're not sure what actually happened. But one hypothesis is that the actual uh, inscription stelae uh, containing the healing tales were exhibited in between the columns and could uh, provide an immediate, uh, an immediate uh, uh, depiction and uh, picture of what was going to happen in, in this building. Often the enchimeterion was uh, close to a spring uh, of allegedly healing water. The use of which for drinking, for bathing, for pouring was part of the incubation ritual and induced or facilitated the appearance of a dream. The water could spring from the walls of the incubation hall, like in the case of Athens. You can see the Asclepieion of Athens on the south slopes of the Acropolis, where the, where the, um, the, the spring of water is basically dug into the rock of the Acropolis and springs straight into the incubation hall. Um, or in other cases, it could be channeled inside the building, like in Epidaurus, where the bus of Asclepius, so-called bus of Asclepius, provided water which could be channeled inside the store, or um, even uh, made accessible uh, through, um, for different degrees of ablution, ablutions and bathing in adjacent rooms, like in Corinth, where the lustra, lustra room, so-called lustra room, is a waterproof room which is uh, um, accessible through a uh, flight of steps and this basically uh, underground. So um, the one important step in this ritual was the actual access to the uh, encomitarian, to the incubation hall. And this access was highly ritualized. Um, before gaining access to the uh, incubation hall and take part in the ritual, the pilgrims were in, encouraged to engage in preliminary rites, such as sacrifices, money offerings and purification rites. These were performed normally following a ritual sequence uh, in very specific for space and time. The best known case, which I'm showing you here in this slide, is that of the Asclepian of Pergamon, in on the Roman period, of course, we're talking of the second, third century AD, uh, where um, a white propylon that you see here in, in uh, red provided a large portico space where, uh, according to the words of Elius Aristides that you see in the slide, who spent uh, um, 12 years in the Asclepian of Pergamon, all pilgrims could assemble, could assemble before uh, being admitted into the sanctuary, uh, were dressed in white garments. This is, uh, of course, presented by Aristides as a dream, uh, but he explains how many others were gathered together uh, as whenever there's a purificatory ceremony and they wore white garments. So we can imagine this mass of people uh, waiting to be uh, admitted into the healing ritual. Um, and uh, what is interesting about the Asclepian of Pergamon is that uh, right uh, to the right of the entrance, uh, it does uh, a very important document, uh, Alex Sacra, Sacred Law, uh, which is preserved uh, and it's uh, a Roman copy of an of a, of a, uh, earlier, probably Hellenistic law, uh, where the pilgrims itinerary in the sanctuary and the um, amount and quality of the preliminary offerings is very, very clearly stated. 
here the text prescribes that after three days of so bodily purifications in the form of fastening and sexual abstinence, a number of offers were had to be made to the gods in charge of the incubation. There was not necessarily Asclepius. So only at the end a suckling pig, a suckling pig was sacrificed to Asclepius and left on, it, on his altar. But before that, precise sums of money had to be paid uh, to uh, to the god into a thesaurus, which is a specific offertory box in the sanctuary, and cakes, a specific type of cakes with nine holes, uh, had to be offered uh, to other minor divinities, and all deposited in separate altars along the route leading to the Enchimeterion. So the pilgrims in this case, um, a sort of viewing uh, cult statues and objects, uh, different altars at the same time and the depositing offerings before entering the incubation hall, uh, performed a sort of ritual movement in and around the sanctuary, ultimately a journey towards health and salvation uh, and sort of raising their expectation and hope. Beside Pergamon, that is a sort of later example, though it has a, a very, uh, very explicit sacred law, uh, we know this, uh, from centuries, this other centuries of Asclepius preserved the traces of this uh, preliminary journey. Uh, most of the known Asclepia have sacrificial areas characterized by the presence of small altars, specifically assigned to the performance of preliminary and bloodless sacrifices and described with the names of Asclepius and members of his family. Uh, the best example is probably that of the Asclepian of Epidorus, where uh, there's a space very clearly defined by small block altars dedicated to Mahaum, Podalirius, Artemis, uh, Aheros, Yatros, Eros Yatros, so a number of, of figures collateral to Asclepius, where uh, obviously bloodless sacrifice could be deposited before the main sacrifice over the altar of Asclepius, which was right on the axis, not pro properly on the axis, but in front of the temple of Asclepius. And this uh, recalls very much the, 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 the sacred law from Pergamon, where uh, I quote um, the, the worshippers is asked to offer a preliminary sacrifice to Zeus Apotropius, a cake with nine holes, to Zeus Meilicius, a cake with nine holes, and to Artemis Procura and Ga Gaia, again, a cake each. Um, so, uh, in addition to this uh, sort of bloodless sacrifices, which preceded the main sacrifice, there was one important issue. This is just to give you an example of how different is the main altar of Asclepius, like in the uh, Asclepian of Messini, where the big sort of later sacrifice was offered with large sacrificial animals, uh, very different from the one of the small uh, block altars that you see uh, in, uh, in the area around the altar. Of Epidorus. So, um, in addition to this, um, the Lex Sacra mentions offers in money. And offers in money are very uh, common in the cult of Asclepius, uh, in the, and of, it was very com commonly um, described by sacred law that pilgrims had to pay a precise sum of money before participating in the ritual. And for this, uh, uh, maybe linked to this practice, we find in many Asclepieia treasury box. Uh, I mentioned this before. Uh, which are sort of offertory boxes uh, made of stone, difficult to open, with a small cavity in the center where coins could be actually dropped in. Some of them are configured uh, with uh, um, uh, sort of figurative uh, devices on top, like this uh, Tesauros from Milos uh, with, a, with, a, with a snake, bronze snake on top. And basically the, the coin was inserted in the mouth of the snake, it fell down into this cavity underneath, and then the Tesauros could be open only um, occasionally uh, with the use of proper with sort of machines machines, not, not by uh, one single person. So this type of, uh, of devices were probably placed next to the main buildings or along the ritual routes and were used for the collection of those preliminary offerings in money um, following specific re regulations. Finally, in this, again, preliminary phase before being in, uh, uh, before accessing the, the, the right, um, a very important role was uh, 
was performed by fountains and basins that provided areas of purification and washing for visitors and pilgrims um, alike, uh, preparing to offer sacrificing, sacrifices or accessing the ritual in general. And here you see from the Epidor uh, Asclepion of Epidoros, again, two examples, so the so-called Doric fountain, which is a sort of monumental fountain with running water, but also sm much smaller devices like Perilanteria, basically basins which were placed in different areas of the sacred route and could uh, allow pilgrims to wash their hands and uh, in, in, in before uh, performing the sacrifices or performing the ritual. So this is what happened before the incubation. But what happens after? Um, the after is what we know best. Uh, after the spending the night in the incubation hall, the healing um, ritual that previously had been private and individualized because we don't know anything actually what happens inside the incubation hall, um, became um, public and opened to, uh, onto a shared and public dimensions. So the outcomes and the results of this personal communication between the God and his worshippers reached finally the audience of a wider public through sculptural representations displayed in the most prominent positions around sacred buildings and processional routes. Marble reliefs representing the moment of healing. You see here votive re two votive reliefs from the Asclepieia of Piraeus and Athens. In both cases, Asclepius imposing his hands seem to, to, to uh, heal somebody who is immersed in this dream or in the sleep of uh, incubation. Uh, on, a, on a bench, in some cases also lying on some sort of uh, um, animal skin, uh, to, to, which was part of the ritual. Uh, so all these reliefs were placed uh, um, in very prominent position and were placed high on, uh, on pillars, specifically made pillars, and sort of, again, gave a very strong visual um, uh, imp impact of the, of the healing of Asclepius. Uh, um, and they represented in, the, in a way the moment of the epiphany of the appearance of Asclepius and his family in front of worshippers. Uh, there were also anatomical ex-votos uh, um, that uh, uh, made of terracotta or marble or metal, these are the ones from Corinth that made of terracotta, uh, that often hung from the, from, from the walls of the buildings and represented body parts healed by Asclepius. Um, there were also, for example, statues of little boys and little girls that attested of the role of the god as the protector of, uh, of uh, youth and child nurture, uh, who accompanied the children in the, in the difficult stages of their uh, growing up uh, and coming to age. Uh, also, tales of healing, uh, I mentioned them before, uh, were inscribed in stone and they were placed in the most prominent positions uh, for the list of Epidaurus, probably inside the Stetora Abaton itself. Um, and they all attested of the magnanimity and the power of the god and this medical family. Uh, in some Asclepieia, it's interesting to notice that probably the, the, the successful healings, so the healing tales were even performed um, and retold uh, in the theatrical areas uh, and in front of crowds of worship. So I show you here the example of the um, healing tale of Diophantes uh, of Stetos uh, from uh, Athens, who was at Zachoro, at Zachoros, a priest of Asclepius, and dedicated a tale of healing whose metric structure seems to be clearly designed for the public performance or reenactment of the miraculous healing, because in the first part, uh, where uh, Diophantes is, is in pain, uh, is, is unable to, to move, um, we we use we we have the anapestic tetrameters this is just a sort of limping walk of the sick while in the second part we have a much more fluid dactylic examiter used to indicate the accomplished healing of course you can see this cannot see this in translation but believe me i mean the set the last verse the tries blessed paleness clepius by your skills your fantas was healed of this painful incurable ailment reads much faster and much uh, and more joyful than the previous part. Uh, 
Um, also, for example, in the Asclepion of Rome, in uh, Tiber Island, uh, inscriptions uh, record how the patients uh, publicly declaimed uh, or performed the healing on a sacred stage, on a sacred bema, um, here on bema, in front of a festive public. Um, and finally, you, we know again from Pergamon and for the writing of Aristides that um, he himself gave choral performances for the god as thanks offerings, specifically as thank offerings to the god in front of a crowd of people again clad in white gathering in honor of the god. Um, these are the, the passages you see in the slide as uh, Aristides says, I also gave public choral performances and I dedicated a silver tripod as thank offering to the god, and at the same time as memorial of the choral performances which I gave. So, um, the, uh, the miraculous uh, um, healings performed by Asclepius and by his family, and the expectations as well that they were able to create, seem to have answer, answered everyone's need for preservation and called the worshippers to a collective participation. And this might explain why between the end of the fifth century and the beginning of the fourth century BC, the cult enjoyed an unprecedented success. And this was a time when the God was the most needed, probably following contemporary dramatic events such as the plague of Athens of the 430s and the outbreak of the Peloponnesian Wars where the Greek, Greeks counted the deads in the thousands. So life-threatening external circumstances in the area might have provided a, um, the right climate for the cult to flourish and probably led the individuals to perceive health as the most precious of the gifts. As Clippus might have provided a sort of psychological answer to the needs for a more poor personal and popularized religion. And therefore, from the last quarter of the fifth century BC, some, something like 300 centuries, which is actually a lot, were founded all over the Greek world in the span of less than a century. And this impressive wave of foundation, you see the distribution of the cult of Asclepius in this slide, this impressive wave of foundation seems to, be, to have been orchestrated mostly by the priests of the century of Epidaurus in the Peloponnese probably the earliest and the most influential um, cult place for the god. This process was uh, accomplished in collaboration, of course, with local individuals and has been defined rightly, I believe, as a form of colonization. So the sources clearly back up this idea since they preserve uh, a number of tales of foundations in which it is always uh, um, one individual uh, who, was, who had been healed uh, by the Epidorian Asclepius, uh, who promoted the foundation uh, um, of a cult, um, either traveling uh, with carrying the statue of Asclepius, or travels with the snake of Asclepius, or invites a delegation of Epidorian priests to found the sanctuary. So you see here, for example, two famous foundations, so like uh, uh, the one of the Asclepion of Lebena, which is recorded in uh, an inscription on the walls of the stoa, or incubation stoa. And we see a Theon, son of Anthotas from Lebena in Crete, who was healed in Epidorus, and after the, after after the incubation and took the god in his own ship uh, for, to, to, to Lebena, uh, where he probably where he came from. And uh, uh, all we, if we see um, the, the foundation tale of Epidorus Limera, uh, which is reported by Pausanias, where the Epidorians from, uh, arrive in a sort of delegation in Laconia uh, and remained and settled there. Uh, and they came also in this case with, with a snake that they were bringing in from Epidorus and was a sort of personification of the god. Um, so um, the, the, we have, uh, if we agree on this idea of a colonization, it's inevitable to think that Epidorus is the center of this colonization. And uh, if we look at the um, archaeology of the century of Epidorus, it seems to confirm that something happened there uh, to make it 
to help the place or to make it become uh, really the most important uh, uh, center for the cult of Asclepius. Um, Epidaurus, you see here uh, in the map, the location was um, actually uh, the earliest cult place dedicated to, to Asclepius as a divine healer. And I must say that very recent excavation seems to confirm this uh, even more and that have brought back the, the dating of the cult even to, to the late 6th century, not anymore, just the 5th century uh, BC. Um, so, but according to what we know, um, uh, we, they, they, it seems that uh, Epidaurus was able to establish itself as a main international cult center, at least uh, from in, in the 5th and 4th century BC. The sanctuary was located in a valley um, and was, as it's often happen, it often happens, linked to an earlier cult place located on the hilltop, the sanctuary of Apollo Maleatas that you see here. In the, in the photograph. So this is the sanctuary in the valley, the sanctuary of Asclepius, and this is the sanctuary of Apollo Maleata on top of the hill. And this, the, the, the sanctuary of Apollo, which was older, of course, and uh, um, it seems like an ash altar and probably a temple were in use there um, as far back as in the eighth century uh, BC. Um, after the sixth century BC, a cult activity seems to have started finally in the lower sanctuary, so the sanctuary of Asclepius. Um, what we have from the archaeology in the in the sixth century, from the mid sixth century, is very little. Uh, it seems clear that, uh, although it seems clear that the main uh, focal points of the Asclepian, Asclepian cult were um, all there um, already in the mid 6th century BC. Uh, so what we have is a small shrine uh, that you see here uh, in blue, together with uh, probably a uh, ash altar, not uh, um, uh, um, just a, a heap of ashes, not, not a proper structure, and uh, a, a well for fresh water uh, to, who, to which probably a portico imperishable material was, uh, was attached. And this suggests us the practice of sacrifice and worshiping in the area shrine and altar, and and of sort of sacred ablush, ablutions, washing, and uh, uh, something similar to incubation probably in this uh, um, uh, perishable material store uh, next to the well. This, the, the next phase seems to confirm in the 5th century BC uh, the, the priority of these two main areas. Um, where buildings, proper buildings were added, a, a rectangular portico was added here to the, to the, to the shrine known as Building E. A, a main altar next to it and several small altars. And um, the predecessor of the store, of the incubation store, is now built in proper sort of architecture next to the uh, well uh, for, uh, of the maybe sacred water uh, for, for, for the cult. Uh, there are also a number of other buildings that are built in the area later occupied by the cult of Asclepius, probably dining rooms. This is not at all certain. And recent excavations have confirmed, uh, brought to light, uh, remains of uh, sacrificial uh, sort of sacrificial and cultic remains in the area of the Tolos, underneath the Tolos of the classical period. So the main um, parts of the cult were the sacrificial area, the structures connected with the use of water, whether for purification or actual contact with the god, and the buildings where the incubation took place. From the fourth century, from the 4th century BC, we have an ambitious uh, new program of reconstruction recorded in many inscriptions that have been recently uh, um, re-edited and cover a period of between 50 to 80 years. Uh, that have, uh, a reconstruction that affects most of the existing structures involved a complete change of the existing topography and had the clear intent of singling out, I believe, Epidaurus as the only birthplace of Asclepius and the main religious focus for pilgrims seeking the help for the god. 
So uh, in this period, we have, okay, sorry. Sorry, everything is coming at the same time, it shouldn't. Okay, at the first phase, we have the construction of a temple and probably the altar and the incubation store. This, we are still in the first years of the, uh, of the fourth century, around the 390s BC. Uh, the second phase sees the construction of the Tolos, so many of the fountains and the Temple of Artemis. And finally, uh, all the way, the second half of the century, all the way to 300 BC, and probably uh, thanks to also Macedonian sponsorship, we have the construction of large and almost buildings for reception that does seem to confirm that this place uh, hosted a lot of people. So we have a large, uh, one of the largest buildings ever built in Greece, uh, which is a sort of a monumental banqueting hall, a vestiatorium, where lots of people were able to dine at the same time, probably to consume the meat from the sacrifices, a monumental uh, hostel, uh, a sort of grand hotel, as was defined by Cavadias in the first excavations, um, uh, for like at least 500 people, a stadium and the theatre, which is out of the, of the area. So um, it is uh, clear that not only the buildings, um, not only the, the main religious focus, focus of the century was uh, emphasized, but also the reception capacity was uh, enlarged. Uh, but I think there's also reason to believe that also the myth and the history of the gods were made explicit in the construction of the new buildings. And I refer here particularly to the temple, to the temple of Asclepius. Because in the temple of Asclepius, uh, probably built in the 390s, uh, it seems to be now the, um, the most uh, agreed upon date. Um, this can be considered the last religious building of, class of the classical period to present a coherent sculptural program and a cult statue in the most traditional way built of ivory and gold, like the Athena Parthenos or the Zeus at Olympia, the most traditional materials for the depiction of divinity. The sculptures uh, um, uh, from the temple decoration are unfortunately very fragmentary, but the pediments uh, have been reconstructed um, in an excellent way, I must say, from circa 200 pieces kept in the National Museum in Athens. And they allow us to identify, at least in the East, of pe East pediment, the scenes of the sack of Troy. Here the figures are arranged in groups of two or three engaged in scenes of fight, of violence, and only a few group groups have been identified with certainty. Uh, we have, for example, Priam being killed uh, by Neoptolemus. We have probably um, Cassandra, um, uh, Ayas, and the Palladium, and possibly Andromache and Astyanax. So the theme of the Sack of Troy, we can say it's a very general one, very common one, a recurrent iconographic subject is in Greek art for the decoration of temples from the archaic period onwards. But in the Epidorian pediment, although the um, identity of the warriors cannot be a certain, we must nevertheless recall uh, the participation of Macaon and Podalirius to the Trojan War, the sons of Asclepius. Um, as uh, both warriors and physicians. Um, in the Iliad, they are defined, I quote, the two sons of Asclepius, the skilled physicians. And later Diodorus writes, I quote, they joined Agamemnon in the expedition against Troy, and during the war they performed great service to the Greeks in curing the wounded most skillfully. So that the sons of Asclepius were actually recognizable among the Achaean heroes in the crowd of the battle cannot be ascertained. But the contemporary viewers might have evoked their deeds through the Trojan episode. And uh, the Acroterian as well of the temple um, was, uh, uh, was uh, probably representing Apollo abducting Epidorian Coronis, the mother of Asclepius, uh, the Epidorian girl with whom the god fell in love. 
So in addition to the sons of Asclepius, also the mother and the father of Asclepius, Apollo and Coronis might have been represented in the same, um, in the same sculptures, in the, in the sculptural group. Um, and it's interesting to think that right in front of the temple, um, they, there was this sacrificial area that I, I showed you before with the, the small altars uh, um, uh, for the preliminary dedications. Many of them evoked exactly the children of Asclepius. Uh, I show you here a transcription of, of, from this altar uh, with the inscription Machaonos of Machaon. So uh, those uh, sons of Asclepius, which might have been evoked by the Trojan Wars on the east pediment of the temple, Temple, were the same being worshipped worshipped in this area in front of the temple together with Asclepius. And um, it's worth noticing also that right in front of the temple, uh, you would have had the view of, uh, um, of Mount Kinortion, where the sanctuary of Apollo was, and the Acroterium was looking exactly towards the mount, uh, the mountain where um, Apollo um, uh, ab abducted Coronis and the young Asclepius was uh, exposed and found later. So a main aim of the temple decoration would have been that, in this case, of sort of tightening the links between this newly built monument, the biography of Asclepius, and the Epidorian landscape. And remains, to my knowledge, unparalleled in other centuries of Asclepius. Um, in other centuries, we have single dedications to Macaon and Podalirius and their representation in votive reliefs, but they're always outnumbered by the dedications to the daughters of Asclepius, who are much more relevant in this, Hygieia in particular, uh, who are simple personifications without really a story behind them, differently from Macaon and Podalirius. Similarly, the early episodes of the life of Asclepius, either as son of Apollo or as a Homeric hero, are never represented, to my knowledge, in visual documents from other sites. So it seems that uh, wanting to recreate this past of Asclepius in Epidaurus, the ultimate aim of this operation was that of showing that Asclepius and his family actually lived in Epidaurus, were from Epidaurus, uh, against all those contrasting literary tradition that connected the god with Thessaly, with Messenia, with Arcadia, and so forth. So through this process of advertising its antiquity and authority in sculptures and buildings, the century of Asclepius built a, a sort of brand, I believe, of religious uh, um, of co colonization, uh, a new model for exploitation uh, so that nearly every polis, uh, that, that's we have, why we have this very uh, thorough foundation of, of many Asclepiaean sort of 50 years, every polis felt the need for a century of the Epidorian healing god and reproduced the Epidorian structures, the images and the rituals. So incubation holds connected to, with sources of water in the form of stoi or porticos. This is what we find in nearly all the Epidorian foundations. Um, areas for preliminary sacrifices with members, uh, for the members of uh, the extended family of Asclepius thank offerings, reproducing the image of the god and his son. And uh, sometimes, of course, to this basic uh, format, new buildings were added, uh, which were mostly uh, to accommodate the growing crowd of worshippers and uh, provide a sort of entertainment center as well for, for, for whoever practiced the Asclepieia. So we have hostels and dining rooms built for overnight visitors, baths and thermal establishments uh, that facilitated the therapeutic use of the water, and of course theaters and stadia, uh, which provided a location for um, contest and uh, entertainment. So all in all, the newly founded Asclepieia were made uh, sort of culture as much as religious centers where large masses of people could gather, could spend time, could be accommodated and could be entertained. And now we come to the second part of this process in a way, because of this impressive number of centuries that were found between the end of the fifth and the fourth century BC, 
uh, most experiences tremendous decadence in the late Hellenistic period and only a few survived the Roman period. But again, in the second century AD, starting under Emperor Hadrian uh, and continuing under the reign of the Antonines, the cult of Asclepius and his surviving centuries experienced a new period of success, comparable to that of the fifth and fourth century BC. To give some examples, the Asclepian of Pergamon that I've already mentioned several times was completely rebuilt during the Hadrianic and Antonine period and was said to become one of the most famous centuries of the Roman world. The Asclepian of Epidaurus underwent substantial restorations uh, thanks to the wealthy benefactor Julius Maior Antoninus Pithodorus, a senator from Asia Minor known from Pausanias as well. The Asclepian of uh, Lebena, and you see here the interventions of uh, Pythodorus, the Baths, the, the, mm, and the Isaian uh, for the Egyptian gods, um, uh, two suits of baths, and maybe in this period, but maybe a little bit later, the construction of the Odeon, which took the uh, place of the monumental Estiatorium, dining place of the previous periods. Um, then the Asclepian of Lebena in Crete uh, that was entirely reconstructed uh, ex novo under the patronage of the rich Cretan notable um, Titus Flavius Xenion. So the popularity of Asclepius in the second century AD was clearly endorsed at the highest levels within the Roman Empire because not only wealthy benefactors such as Pythodorus, Xenian, the ones I have already mentioned, but also the emperors themselves seem to be keen on Asclepius. In Rome, capital of uh, the empire, oh, this is just to give you an idea, I forgot about these two statues of how popular Asclepius and Aegeus they were, were, so that private individuals in the second century AD chose the iconography of Asclepius and Aegea to be represented in uh, funerary or honorific statues, such as in this case, uh, you can see portraits, uh, physiognomic portraits being applied to the iconography of uh, um, the healing gods. So, um, I was going to Rome, where um, the century of Asclepius uh, uh, on Tiber Island had been founded in the third century BC, after the god had been evoked again from Epidaurus in order to avert an epidemic. And Asclepius had arrived actually in Rome uh, in the form of a snake sailing on a ship. He had disembarked in Tiber Island, as it is retold by Ovid. In the second century AD, the century was uh, probably restored and refounded under the patronage of Antoninus Pius, when the um, iconography of the myth of arrival of Asclepius from Epidaurus was reproduced in sculpture in the famous relief uh, on the prow of a ship uh, that, is, that is still visible in, uh, in Tiber Island and shows actually uh, visually the arrival of Asclepius in the island uh, you can see uh, the profile of Asclepius with this uh, uh, snake stuff uh, on the prow of a ship. Um, in this monumental relief, so it was reproduced, but also in a series of medallions that you see on the right, issued to commemorate the ninth century from, centenary from the foundation of Rome, and where you see the arrival of Asclepius in the form of a snake uh, arriving in the Tiber, this is the personification of, of the river. Um, so uh, clearly, uh, there was an intention of uh, of associating with the with the cult and with the arrival of Asclepius on the side of uh, on the part of Antoninus Pius. But the most relevant example is, of course, the one of Hadrian, uh, who was actually associated to the cult of Asclepius Soter, the savior in Pergamon, and was worshipped himself as Neos Asclepius. Neil Asclepius in a newly built temple, obviously directly connected to Roman imperial um, initiatives, since it was made also to reproduce a smaller version of the Pantheon in Rome, similarly rebuilt by Hadrian. So later, um, both the imperial couples, Marcus Aurelius and Faustina, and Lucius Verus and Lucilla, uh, chose to be represented in the guise of Asclepius and Aegea in a series of coins from Pergamon. So 
The preference given to Asclepius in the second century AD by both private benefactors and members of the imperial household is such as to suggest that Asclepius became the most or one of the most important gods, at least within the Roman East. In this period of renaissance of this cult, Asclepius might have been seen as a savior god, again in the years of the Antonine Plague, uh, 165 to 189 circa, but there were also different cultural factors, of course, at play. According to the sophist Elianus, Asclepius was, and I quote, the patron of those who practice the paideia, where paideia was that deep education, knowledge of the past, the end of tradition, history and landscape, myths and ritual, that eventually translate into a value system and a mode of thought for those intellectual, of the intellectuals of the highest social classes sharing the philosophical ideal of the second sophistic, those intellectuals who in the end occupy the highest rank ranks of the Roman bureaucracy. So the paideia in the second and third century Greece allowed the benefactors, emperors, and office holders to recognize themselves as taking part in the same intellectual communica communication and consequently to negotiate power relations. Asclepius seems to have enjoyed a completely new role as a patron of these intellectuals and members of the contemporary elite within a contemporary philosophical system where the sage par excellence is said to be provided with healing powers and to be able to accomplish a mission similar to that of the children of Asclepius in the known world. So to conclude, Notwithstanding uh, the different historical circumstances which led to the success of Asclepius uh, um, in the classical and in the Antonine periods, these two phases are united by the two key elements. First, there was the desire on the part of private individuals to leave a personal legacy, a personal imprint on the religious and spiritual life of the contemporaries through foundations, for example, which all bear a name, foundation and refoundation of cults or monumentalization of existing ones. And second, Asclepius presented himself as a god who was sort of young enough, he only comes out in the fifth century BC, doesn't have a long history, and flexible enough to be deployed in different fashions as a god, as a hero, as a patron of intellectuals. And this explains also the ease with which he could sort of hide and revive if necessary and take the different forms of the physician the savior or the wise man, seconding the needs of the individuals. So much so that according to some, his iconography could later accommodate even the earliest type of Christ. And for a little while, the two became admittedly interchangeable in the realm of healing, as explained by Justinus, who writes, I quote, when we say that he, speaking of Jesus, made well the lame and the paralytic and those who were feeble from birth and that resurrected the dead, we shall seem to be mentioning deeds similar to and even identical with those which were said to have been performed by Asclepius. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your very interesting lecture. And uh, I would like to ask uh, members of the audience uh, if they have uh, some questions on Milena, please uh, raise your hands uh, virtually. And then you will be uh, given a uh, Yes, please, uh, Bob Arnott. Uh... Yeah. Thank you very much for that, um, for that excellent lecture. And um, it brought into focus many of the issues around the uh, around the use, uh, origins use and use of, of the sepia. I've got one question. Um, some of the some of the things you just you have shown as features of a sepia, such as the ex voto, um, and also, of course, you mentioned the origins of the century of Apollo Maliata, so the Epidorus. Do you think any of this any of this combined um, could be seen to have origins in the Bronze Age? Ah. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> well, the thing is, uh, I, I always, um, uh, since uh, 
I started researching years and years and years ago, Asclepius. I always saw similarities in, yeah, yeah, in the past. The problem, my pro main problem is, and this is probably a question to everybody and everyone else, which I've not been able to answer myself, is this Asclepius? You know, if we if we talk, if we discuss Asclepius as a god, as a as a, as a Greek god, yeah. I think it's. I find that it's very clear that he starts as a god, as a son of Apollo, and so on in the fifth century, and he starts in Epidaurus. But then what does he build on? I mean, how does this cult build up? How does it, what does he incorporate? Um, it, it's certainly older, older, but uh, the question is, uh, is it, is it just a common feature of healing cults or, or healing activities or uh, that Asclepius then uh, sort of uh, gathers I mean, together or not? But yes, the answer is I mean, yes, there is. A, you might have a point there. I, my other area of research other than the Aegean Bronze Age is the Bronze Age of Northern India. And I found evidence of cult um, in the Harappan civilization, very similar to the Mycenaeans. They're not that different uh, to the ones that you study. So you may have a point that it's a commonality of, 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 of healing cult that exists in a number of uh, civilizations, um, which have um, developed, you know, like many other, like many other things, um, independently. I mean, it's, I mean, I'm not challenging you <laughs> what you're saying. It's uh, except yeah, say, that's but it all. Let's put it all together and see what it shows us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Thank you for the observation. Picture. And can I have a quick last second question? Yeah. Can I go to the other end, at the end of the Asclepia? Um, it's always it's always interested me the way that uh, some 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 Asclepia are sort of developed into the Christian religion, joined a role in the Christian religion. Look at the Byzantine Church on top of the um, sanctuary in Athens, and how in, in many respects that might just be what I describe as seamless. Do, do you see the same? Absolutely. I yeah. think you're yeah. absolutely right. And uh, this is, again, an area that I, I'm, I don't, I never covered very well because it's not part of my yeah. um, studies. But what I notice is certainly that uh, the very earliest Christian church seemed to develop on centuries of Asclepius. That's right, that's right, the, yeah. the church of the Asclepian of Athens, which was completely, the whole Asclepian was transformed into a basilica. Mm -hmm. uh, the store was just one of the aisles of the basilica. Um, it, it's very, very early. It's very, very early. It's right at the end of the cult. It, it, we don't even know if, if one and the other were sort of uh, super, sort of working at the same time. The Basilica Tepidoros as well is very early. So the, the, there is a sort of seamless uh, trans transmission. I'm sure about this. And yeah. th there's also, I mean, some people have studied also forms of Christian incubation that have a lot to do with the incubation of, uh, of Asclepius apparently. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. We are in full agreement. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have uh, one more question from uh, Nikita Maskrom, please. Uh, yes, uh, hello. Uh, thank you for a very interesting uh, lecture. And uh, yeah, I have a small question. So uh, I can see that there is uh, evidence for an increased popularity among Roman emperors uh, of Asclepius uh, in the second century AD. I was wondering whether there is any evidence for increased popularity of Asclepius among general population at that time. Yes, I think it's uh, it, it goes hand in hand, but uh, that's the problem of archaeology as usual, that we always uh, uh, perceive much, uh, we have a much stronger perception of uh, um, people who are higher up in the hierarchy, such as emperors and elite, uh, rather than the others. But certainly, yes, there must have been large amounts of people participating in the cult of Asclepius, uh, because also the dimensions of the buildings, if you think of the Asclepian of Pergamon, is, uh, it seems to be an immense complex. That, uh, uh, and also, there's a lot of uh, 
um, uh, there's uh, evidence, especially in the East, of uh, um, domestic cults for Asclepius. Asclepius is, is, is very common in statuettes, uh, which were probably used for uh, domestic cults. Uh, there's a recent study um, um, uh, by Brian Mertens on the statuettes of Asclepius from the Athenian Agora, for example. Uh, and there are hundreds of statuettes uh, from Athens, from sort of Roman and late Roman period, that obviously were used in uh, in uh, in houses, in uh, in domestic contexts. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much for this. Thank you. Uh, are there any more questions? Yes, Mark. Um, I have two questions, if I may. Uh, first is about. Um, you're, you mentioned Hygieia as a personification. Uh, I wrote my master thesis about Hygieia, about her identity, and I concluded that we cannot speak about personifications in Greek religion. Um, personification is a post-medieval term which content does not relate or identify with the Greek prospopoia or atopoia or the Latin personificatio. There are different dimensions. So would you agree with me that we cannot and name um, God's personifications. It, it would also be useless to worship a lifeless abstraction of a, of a noun. And the second question I have is, I'm currently working on a dissertation about the Christian transformation of temple sleep or incubation in uh, late antiquity. And there are two strands. So the, the first is that uh, the first group says there's a direct content, uh, continuation, which only looks at textual evidence, and the second group looks at archaeological evidence and argues for indirect continuity. There are examples from Asclepiaia where churches are built over the Asclepiaia directly, but also uh, not directly, but further away. How, do, how would you view the, the, um, that transformation process? Well, thank you. Considering that I'm not an expert, neither in either in the personification or in Christian churches, my opinion, I'm, I'm perfectly happy not to speak of personification, but, uh, you know, of divine entities as such. But uh, uh, what is interesting, um, I think of uh, Tüche uh, being mentioned in the Lex Sacra of the Asclepian of Pergamon, is that uh, it's probably the only um, that, that of Pergamon is probably the only sacred law that preserves uh, um, this sort of list of divinities uh, that preside uh, the preliminary rites. And uh, um, probably I wouldn't have been able to read the um, altars of the Asclepian with the single inscriptions uh, as a preliminary area and so on if I didn't um, uh, have this uh, guide from the from the Pergamon uh, um, uh, law, so it's uh, you know whatever it is, personification or not, it's a very useful you know um, uh, figure uh, for understanding better the cult of Asclepius. For the church, uh, for, for the incubation, I'm I, I'm not very much. I've I've never been very much into. I've never looked very closely into this incubation issue, uh, but uh, I I remember the the problem of the sources. You you're absolutely right. The, the sources seem to imply a seamless, uh, uh, especially for Athens and so on, uh, a, a seamless uh, transition into into Christian incubation. Um, it's, it's difficult to say because, uh, first of all, the incubation process in itself, even in antiquity, is something that has been kept very, very uh, mysterious for us in itself. <laughs> so uh, it, it's, it cannot be really compared straightforwardly. Uh, what is very interesting, I find, is the, the Asclepion in Athens, because of its transformation straight away into a basilica, and uh, it's intriguing to see how the structures could have been used in the same or in different ways, because they are exactly the same structures. This, uh, the, the area was just cleaned and then the structures were used as they were. Uh, and the, 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 the presence of this, the, the spring and so on. Uh, and I'm, I ask you, since you've been um, studying this more closely, what, what do you think? 
Uh, well, you uh, what you see is um, uh, it's the the first trend of direct continuation started from the 1900s with the dissertation of Ludwig Deubner. The incubatione is a Latin dissertation, and he argues only on textual on, on ancient texts inscriptions that there is a direct continuation. So gods are the same as saints, uh, temples are the same as churches, um, just because of the, the function of the cult. But then you see uh, that there is another debate coming, which adds archaeological evidence. So they look closely more how are those buildings structured. And you see that um, Asclepiaia or temples are differently structured than churches. They have different rooms, different spaces where incubants could lie. Um, so there, th that's a big gap between a, a, a Greek temple and a, a, a Christian uh, church. Uh, and you see that in some cases, there, there are a lot of centuries between uh, the decay of a Greek temple and, and uh, to build a church around that. So there, there's a lot of factors which um, makes it difficult to decide is there direct or indirect co uh, continuation. There are several authors like Hedwig von Ehrenheim from Sweden, uh, Ildiko Zepregi. There are scholars who are writing on this subject. Uh, I've studied this for the last three years already. And you see also that they also uh, contradict themselves. So uh, in, for example, Ildiko Zepregi, for example, she writes that in the in the third line of her article, there is direct continuation, and in the fifth, there is indirect continuation. It, they really don't know exactly how to look. So that's my task in my project to graphic critical analysis about this uh, Christian transformation, which is very interesting. And maybe you've read the book of Jill Remberg, the two volumes about. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. He, is, he is very critical about. Uh, naming some phenomenon like Christian incubation. I've, I think it was there. And if I may also answer the question to you from did those two traditions uh, uh, existed next to each other? There is a, a example of the Greek uh, Aretargos who had a uh, severe kidney disease and he went to the church of the uh, Saint Tecla, female Saint Tecla, he, uh, she cured him, but when he, uh, but when he was asked on who cured you, then he said Apollo Sarbadonios. So that's a, a example of what I call ritual dynamics, since I work from the perspective of ritual studies. So you see that there are some fluent lines which flow into each other. So it's it's not so uh, black and white as sometimes is described in the literature. Thank you. Thank you. Please, uh, are there any uh, further questions uh, on Milena? If uh, anyone would like to ask, uh, uh, please uh, virtually raise your hand. But uh, it seems uh, there are no more questions. In that case, uh, I would like to thank you uh, very much uh, for staying with us. And uh, especially, I would like to uh, thank uh, to, to Milena uh, for giving us uh, this uh, wonderful and very, very interesting lecture. Milena, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, I'm my hand. And uh, I would like to uh, say goodbye to, to everyone and uh, hopefully to, to see you again uh, soon on, on some uh, other occasion. Well, thank you very much. Uh, have a very nice evening and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. I'll see. Goodbye. Thank you.